everyone. So first I'm going to say I'm really hungry, so let's see how this affects uh, my lecture giving today. <laughs> um, hopefully not too much. Anyway, I decided to talk about neutropenic fever because it's a topic that comes up all the time in the ED. And at least if you're like me, you're like, oh, you know, they probably need some antibiotics. This is bad. But that's kind of about as deep as my knowledge got before um, starting to prepare for this. So what am I doing? OK, so what do I want you to get out of this today? Um, first of all, you know, know what it is, be able to recognize it, when to sort of get yourself on this mental pathway. Um, I want you to know who are the high risk patients, who are the low risk patients, um, how to start treatment when it's indicated, assuming it's indicated, um, and also when you need to do other things or be thinking about other things um, as well. So to start with, um, neutropenia is defined typically as an ANC, and we're going to come back to that, under 1,500. And severe neutropenia is an ANC under 500, um, or if you ex somehow are expecting it to fall that low within the next seven days. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm not an oncologist. I'm, I wouldn't necessarily know how to predict when it's going to fall that low, but that's in there too. Um, and what's a temperature in this setting? Um, you know, we're used to thinking of fever as a over 100.4 period. Um, from neutropenic fever, it's actually defined a little bit different. It's any oral temperature over 101, or um, if they sustain a temperature over 100.4 for over an hour. Now, this to me gets a little tricky because, as, as you'll see in, in a minute, um, it's actually recommended when you have a neutropenic fever to start treatment as soon as possible. So in reality, I don't know that you're going to be keeping the patient around, waiting for repeat temperatures, see if they really stay up there, or if you're just going to go with it and ask questions later. Um, lastly, and interesting to me is it's actually not recommended to take a rectal temperature in, the, in this context. Um, and the reasoning is that these patients have you know, essentially no, no real immune system. And also, if they're on chemo, they're very likely to have a bad mucositis. And so the risk of introducing a severe uh, systemic infection from taking a rectal temperature um, outweighs the benefit of knowing what that temperature is. Um, so how do you calculate the ANC? Here it is, simple formula. Um, the only catch here is that um, it relies on bands. And you know, if you've been at Monty recently, you'll see our band count has been replaced by Im immature granulocyte count. And they're related concepts. They're both you know, immature white blood cells coming out of the bone marrow. Um, but it's not actually the same thing. Um, and if you look at why labs have replaced band count with immature granulocyte count, it's actually because the band counts were not really that accurate, not really that clinically predictive. So do with that what you will. I don't know. I tried to find an answer to this, and no one, um, I couldn't find an answer. I don't know if anyone knows. But you can, I mean, you can get a pretty good estimate. Assuming the patient doesn't have a huge amount of GANS, you can get a pretty good estimate without the bands. So I would probably try to use it, see where it comes out. You're going to get a ballpark anyway. Um, in terms of who's high risk and who's low risk, um, if the patient has any of these things, they're considered high risk. So the, again, the anticipated ANC that's going to be low. Any comorbidities? Now, for any of you guys who have ever worked in the Bronx, when was the last time you had a cancer patient on chemo and that was their only medical problem? Yeah, right. OK, so that's basically all our patients right there. Um, also, hypotension, pneumonia, new abdominal pain, neurologic changes. So as far as I can say, I don't think I've ever seen a neutrophilic fever patient in REDs who did not meet one of these criteria. There's also this, oh, this did not come out very well, but um, there's this mask risk index um, that also helps stratify people. And again, you're going to see all of our patients are going to come out high risk than this. Anything less than, um, t than uh, 21, 21 points is low risk. But you can see uh, dehydration requiring IV fluids, if they have that, then they, that, that's three points alone. And when was the last time you saw a febrile patient on chemo come into the ED and you talk to your attending and they're like, nah, I don't think they need any fluids. So again, basically all of our patients are going to be high risk. Any you know, severe illness, hypotension, respiratory diseases, uh, depending on what kinds of cancer they have, um, how old they are. So basically almost all the people are going to be high risk. So what do you actually do? You have. Just one quote, when you say high so, risk, low risk, uh, so typically when you look at this, a high risk, low risk is for outpatient treatment is what, yeah. what it's usually defined as. And outpatient treatment 
if it's a very selective population, is actually still gets antibiotics. It's just a matter of who needs to get hospitalized. Right? Yeah, exa exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah, there's this theoretical population of these low-risk febrile neutropenic patients who, with very you know reliable patient, close follow-up with oncology, you can give them PO antibiotics and send them home. But I think in our EDs, we're almost not going to see that population. And it has to be done really in conjunction with, a, with an oncologist. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And uh, the other thing is a lot of ours are sent in by their oncologist. And, um, you know, or in close control, they called, and uh, again, those are ones that the oncologist is saying, please take this patient, you know, I'm, I'm worried about them. Um, I think that's going to be a more of an outpatient thing. Um, okay, so this patient walks into your ED, 65 years old, small cell lung cancer, last chemo was two weeks ago, temp is 100.2, they have hypoten hypertension and COPD. What are you going to do with this patient? Almost the minute they walk in the door. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, so draw the lactate, otherwise you're going to not meet your core measures, whether or not it's going to help you. Um, but you're going to start the antibiotics. That's what you got to do. So um, the recommendation according to all the official guidelines I was looking at right now is within 60 minutes, but some people are recommending within 30 minutes, within 15 minutes. Basically, as soon as this patient walks in, you know, they're on chemo, you're not going to wait for the labs to calculate the ANSI. You're going to start the empiric antibiotic coverage. And um, the, the standard of care as of now is, is actually single antibiotic coverage with something with uh, pseudomonal coverage. So that can be cefepime, meropenem, our favorite, fibrotilin, tazobactam, uh, and ceftazidine. However, you're thinking, you might be thinking, but every time they come in, I always give them vague plesocin. Is that really unnecessary? Well, here's why we're doing that. Here's who's recommended for gram-positive coverage, and that would be with, with uh, vancomycin for, for resistance. So is anyone with hemodynamic instability, severe sepsis, pneumonia, cultures with gram-positive, line infections, skin infections, and patients with mucositis reserving, uh, receiving certain prophylaxis? So I was trying to figure out who would not get this coverage, and all I could come up with is a rock-solid, stable patient with a UTI. <laughs> there might be some others, but most of them are going to be getting uh, that double coverage. Is there any like, risks to going to, like, like, go to an infusion center? It's kind of like in those dialysis patients, they always have like, worse coverage. Yeah, I mean, be, so if you're talking about pneumonia coverage, if someone's on chemo, that also puts them under the healthcare acquired pneumonia uh, paradigm as well. So that's. So that's in addition to whatever we have. Well, they're overlapping because this list includes pneumonia. So if you're suspecting or confirming pneumonia, um, then that's included. Um, and again, it's important to realize these patients, they have, they have no neutrophils. So you might suspect pneumonia, you get the test x-ray, there's no infiltrate. That doesn't mean there's not an infection. It just means there's no pus because they have no neutrophils. So um, you, know, you have to have a very high index of suspicion uh, in this population. Fever can be the only sign that anything is wrong. Um, what about antifungal coverage? Who needs antifungals? Um, the answer to this one is actually that most patients uh, are not recommended to have antifungal coverage right off the bat. Um, that's usually more for patients who are still <coughs> spiking fevers after four to seven days of initial treatment. Um, or the, other, the, uh, the case where you would is if they, you know, on their last admission, they had candidemia and required uh, antifungals. Then when they walk in, I would, I would treat them with that immediately. And there's a variety of drugs that are all, all considered reasonable choices. Um, what if the patient has a PICC line or a dialysis catheter, a midline, something else? Are you going to take it out? Um, so the answer to here is a little more complicated. So if you have a gross cellulitis right over the surface, by all means, take that out. They don't, that's not helping them. Um, again, you have to be careful because they're not going to have pus coming out of there. They're not going to be making pus most of the time. Um, however, otherwise, uh, the decision to remove a line or leave it is guided by the culture results. And we're generally speaking not going to have that in the EUD. So this is an upstairs problem. Leave that thing in unless it's grossly infected. And uh, they can take, start the antibiotics. They can tag it out upstairs if that's indicated. Um, viral infections, also um, a big factor here. Um, you know, HSV, 1 and 2, zoster, these get reactivated when patients are severely immunosuppressed. Um, CMV, EBV, human herpes virus 6 can also be reinfections or new infections, and respiratory viruses. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were with me. Um, last week in Monty, had a patient, neutropenic fever, super sick, you know, 8 liters of fluids, started on pressors. The only thing we got back on him was RSV. 
And you know, I don't know whether he maybe really had a pneumonia, didn't show up on his x-ray, or maybe he was just that sick from the RSV. And you know, it's more of an intellectual point because you're still, even if you think it's a virus, you're still going to give them the antibiotics in case you're wrong. Um, but, but it really does happen. Um, one other thing just sort of to know about is uh, the myeloid reconstitution syndrome. And this is similar to the HIV-associated immune reconstitution syndrome. And this is where patients get sicker as their immune system is more able to mount a response. So anytime when someone is infected and they're getting better at the same time, they may actually look like they're getting worse and it's just that they're getting an immune system. And you know, in practicality, the, again, this isn't going to change anything. You have to assume that it's worsening infection and treat as such, um, but that, that can be what's actually going on. Um, so to summarize, um, patient on chemo or chemo within the last six weeks walks into your ED with a fever. Um, you're not going to wait for those labs. You're going to assume they're neutropenic and proceed as indicated. They're going to need immediate broad spectrum antibiotics, usually penicillin with pseudomonal coverage, and for most of them, they're also going to get vancomycin. There is this group of truly low risk patients who with a reliable patient, a reliable oncologist, stable everything, no high risk criteria, they can be discharged with PO antibiotics, but proceed with caution. Um, if they're septic, the care is the same. Start the antibiotics, give them the fluid, uh, not, nothing really changes there. And also just keep in the back of your mind uh, viral and fungal infections, that these can be uh, very significant in this population.